before I get to our first talk, I just want to make a quick announcement. We're going to do a seaside box of sorts this afternoon. The idea just to sort of get some feedback from seaside users and what they're looking to see in upcoming versions, and also see if we can figure out a way to get more people contributing so that we can keep up the pace with future releases. So, those of you who are seaside users who'd like to participate in that discussion, I think we'll be here after the last talk prior to the social event. Um, so, um, so uh, our first so talk our here first talk uh, is by a relative newcomer to the small tech community. And by relative newcomer, I mean newcomer who's only been doing this for a quarter century or so. He has been, I think, at every small talk conference I've ever attended. North America, Europe, everywhere. I think we seem to have overlapping conferences. And the first and presentation the first I saw him do was involved with juggling in front of a presentation screen, as I recall. Virtual juggling. Virtual juggling. So I can only imagine what he has to say about parsing. So without further ado, so without further ado, so without further ado, show us what he has in his pocket. What he has in his pocket. What he has in his pocket. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And hope all of you are more awake than I am. More awake than I am. So a parser in my pocket. So what do I mean by that? Well, whenever I do a, a, a project around the house or something, the first thing that happens is you drag out the toolbox. And you work for a while, and you work for a while, and you do this, and you do that. But you know, there's something that always happens, which is that there's two or three tools that you're using a lot. And those tools always end up, you guessed it, in the pocket. So, and by the way, just in case anyone's wondering, that is not my actual tools. Um, so, um, so, um, so, uh, <laughs> so, uh, 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 you know, the things that you use really frequently end up in your pocket um, and not hanging out in the, in the yeah, bottom of the toolbox. So there's, you know, kind of, you know, me and parsers go way back, go way back, that far back, that far back, that far back. You know, because when I got out of school, I escaped. And I, you know, I knew about parsers, I knew they existed. I didn't have any real cause to use them, so they just sort of languished in the bottom of my toolbox, part of the old box, ever. Um, it was just that funny looking tool that I didn't really know how to use. And then, and then, and then yeah, I started doing some yeah, things that doing needed. These are all turned off. These are all turned off. These are all turned off. I have checked. I have checked. I have checked. Yeah, I, I noticed. Yeah, yeah there's like, noticed, a, like yeah, a four there's second delay. Like a four second delay. Four second delay. Ah, oh, 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 o
the 70s and combined them with some ideas from the 90s and an idea of two of his own, and he put them all together and he said, hey, look, you know, if you take all these ideas that have been largely ignored and you put them together, you get something really neat. And we'll be talking a little yeah, more we'll about what those, yeah, those, yeah, those things are. But yeah. you know, this paper got some attention. People started looking at this and saying, hey, that would be neat. So, um, so the next thing you know, it's 2007, and Gilad Braca has put a uh, peg-based uh, parser in, uh, into Newspeak and published this paper, Executable Grammars in Newspeak. Executable Grammar because the, the Newspeak code for the grammar uh, actually, I mean, it, the, he managed to make the Newspeak code that, executed, that was executable be the grammar and looked a lot like the DNF. Can't do that quite as easily in Smalltalk, but uh, um, he also used a parser combinator, which we'll talk more about later. So um, nobody says parsing expression grammars, it's too long, so we shorten that to PEG. Then PEG is too long, so we shorten that to PEG. So it's all PEG parsers. So since 2007, there's been a, a bunch of, of peg parsers written in Smalltalk. Um, I wrote one in early 2008, just a little um, toy one uh, to play around with some of the early parsing of, of Ruby, which I talked a little bit about in my talk last year. Um, also in uh, 2008, Michael Lucas Smith uh, built a, a peg parser for the Extremes project, which uh, Martin Kubitik talked about um, on Monday. Um, uh, Alessandro Worth, made the Ometa project uh, at Viewpoints Research. And we're gonna be looking at that a lot today. And then just more recently, um, Lucas has written uh, Petit Parser, which um, is an interesting uh, parser combinator framework in, uh, in uh, Smalltalk. And there's probably a bunch more that I don't know about. So what we're gonna look at today is I'm going to take a quick review look at, at grammars and, and pegs. We're going to look at OMETA2 um, through some examples of some, some real world uh, kind of unconventional projects that I've been doing, fairly small. And then we're going to take a quick look at the end at uh, parser combinators and, and petite parser. And uh, then we'll take some questions. Also, feel free to interrupt me with questions at any point. Um, even if they're completely irrelevant, because I don't know how much time this talk actually takes. So I know how much time I have, but I'm sure I can fit in questions. Okay, so what we've m typically been using for many years in, uh, in software is context-free grammars, usually in the form of BNF or some mutation of the BNF notation, the Bacchus Nauer form. So you see something like, um, like this example here, where we have a conditional, uh, this is sort of like a uh, if then else from a, a typical uh, procedural language. So you have, you say that you define a conditional to be the literal if followed by some other production that is a cond and then a literal then and then a statement or with the vertical bar you get an or, you can have the if and then and then the else. And these context-free grammars are based on, they were, they were invented for natural language analysis. And they're based on the idea of this is how you generate valid statements in a, a language, is that you, you follow these rules and you can generate valid statements. So they're made for generation. They're not actually made for recognition. And what we wanna do typically um, in software is that is that we want humans to be the generators and we want the computer to recognize. So we want something that's a little more recognition based. This particular um, context free grammar has a, a little problem in that, in that you don't necessarily, it's not easy when you're trying to recognize it to know when you see an if and a statement followed by a then and a statement as to whether or not you should be looking for an else at that point because of the way this is defined. And one of the big changes uh, in PEG, and PEG looks a lot like a context-free grammar. There's just a few key differences that make all the difference. One of the key changes is that the, is that choice is ordered. 
in the context-free grammar, this, this um, or, you can choose one or the other. There's no preference because you're just generating. You choose one or the other. Both are valid. Um, but that doesn't tell you how to, how to prioritize things when you're, when you're recognizing them. So many languages have to have some additional rules about how, how we're going to interpret this grammar. The rule isn't actually in the grammar itself. Well, in PEG, it's, it's there in that, in that when you get an OR in PEG, you try to match the thing before the OR, the first thing. And then if that fails to match, then you try to match the second thing. You never try to match the second thing if the first thing succeeds. So, um, which means that you have to do it in this order for the if-then-else case, because if I did it in the order that I had on the other slide, which was perfectly valid for the context-free grammar, then the else would never match because the if statement or if cond then statement would match first and it would never even try to look for the else. But here, when you put that else in, then it's completely um, unambiguous as to how that works. Okay, so first example. Um, this is uh, doing uh, incremental backup for a file server. This is not a traditionally a place you would find a parser. Um, but I had this problem, and it seemed like a parser would fit one piece of it, so there we go. So I have a file server at home, and I back it up every night, and it backs up onto one of these two uh, hot pluggable uh, two terabyte uh, SATA drives. And that works very well, and we, and I swap out the drive once a month, and this picture was taken during a swap, so that they were actually both out of the machine and neither one of them was at my house because it's off-site backup kind of deal. So the way we back it up is, to, is by using one of the, one of the hidden features, um, relatively hidden, of rsync. rsync has a lot of features. I don't know which ones we consider hidden. But we use a command something like this. So basically we are um, backing up the drive caboodle1 the file server is named Caboodle because it's the Lord High everything else in my house. Does everything except the firewall. Um, and we're backing it up onto this backup drive into this directory with a date. And the key is we've got this link desk thing where, which makes it an incremental backup so that it looks in, in this directory for identical files. And if it finds the identical files in the older backup, then it will just make a hard link from the new backup directory to, the, to that file rather than actually taking the disk space for the file. It's a very clever thing to do. I read about it somewhere and said, ooh, ooh, that sounds like the way to do backups, so I've been doing it that way. Now, the difficulty of this is you've got this nice command here, and you can can the whole thing except for, except for these dates. It's like, what date do you, do you put? You know, this one's always today's date, but what date do you put here? Well, you want the date of the newest backup previous to the one you're doing today. Now, in this particular example, you see that's more than a month ago because this is the first backup after I've swapped the backup drives. So I need to be able, if I want to automate this, I need to be able to detect what's the latest backup. So, well, how do I tell? Well, I, I do an ls dash L on the directory that holds all the backups. This is an actual um, LS that I pulled off at home before I left home. And you can see under an older system, some of them have timestamps as well as the dates in the name. Some of them just have the dates. So I said, well, what I need to do is to, is to parse this, and then I can find not only the dates that I need for a new backup, but I can also analyze which ones of these are, should be aged out. You know, because I want to keep daily backups back a certain distance and then weekly backups beyond that and monthly beyond that and a couple of yearlies or something. So, so I need to know what the dates are. So that's where the parsing comes in. This here is the, is the text that I want to parse. And I want to be able to get a list of dates out so I know what backups I have on the drive and then I can analyze from there. So at this point, I'm going to sit down and switch um, over to uh, actually working on on Faro.
Okay, so we've got here a, uh, an image with, with uh, Ometa 2 loaded into it. And I've got my incremental backup uh, project. And I have a backup listing parser. And we're just going to go through this and you'll get an idea of how, of how um, Ometa 2 works by looking at this. Now, this is a grammar class. So um, in order to, um, and each production in the grammar is a method. And the Ometa2 term for this is rule, and that's a much shorter word anyway, so I'm just going to call them rules. Um, so each rule is a method, and rules are written in, um, in Ometa syntax, but we're able to use the standard browser because it, um, because it overrides the compiler and is compiled and uh, written in, in Ometa. So Ometa is written in itself, of course, like any good language. Um, so let's take a look. The start production is listing. So we get this listing equals um, directory line star anything star. So that's, that is the, you know, so that says you can have zero or more directory lines and then there might be some stuff at the end of the, end of the file. And in fact, there usually is. It's usually a new line that's messing things up. This is um, typically scannerless parsing. That is, you don't have a separate lexer or scanner um, tokenizing things up front. You're just actually um, parsing the, the input uh, stream of objects directly. Yes? Uh, let's actually take a look. Yeah. How's that? Okay. I have to be able to reach the view button at some point here. Oh, that looks good. That looks good, I think. Okay. Um, so it's scandalous parsing. It's simply parsing a stream of input characters, or actually it can be, in Ometa, it can be a stream of any input objects um, at all. So we, if you want to implement scanner, scanner full parsing, for instance, you can do that by taking uh, two parsers, one with a simple grammar, that's your, basically your lexer, and that would then produce a stream of tokens, which would be fed to a second parser, uh, which, would, which would parse the tokens. Or you could parse things that are uh, inherently uh, a stream of objects to start with, like, like I've um, considered whether or not you could uh, parse a, uh, a stream of mouse events for, for gesture recognition, that sort of thing. Okay, so, um, so here we're looking for our directory lines, and then here we're looking for anything garbage at the end of the file so it just doesn't fail to parse. And this is a semantic action um, that is attached to this rule, and what that is is it, it's, you have the little right arrow symbol, and then uh, in square brackets you've got some arbitrary small talk code that is executed whenever this rule matches. And you can do that for entire rules, or you can do it for subrules. I think we've got a couple examples of, of doing it for pieces of rules um, as well. So let's kind of drill down a little bit. Um, anything is the one built-in rule that matches any object. Um, so directory line. So a directory line, if you remember, we can go back here. What does it look like? Well, we've got a bunch of stuff and then a bunch more stuff, and then a bunch more stuff that I don't care about, and a bunch more stuff that I don't care about. And finally, we get to um, a date with a possible time on it. And so I'm just going to, I could actually parse all that stuff and write grammar for it and analyze it, but I don't really need to right now. So basically, I'm just going to skip to the good stuff. So I say, what this here says is is anything as long as it's not a backup date and then repeat that as many times as necessary and then actually get the backup date now this um, this not predicate that tilde is one of the more powerful features of, of peg parsing it's not original with peg parsing but it's it's one of the things that makes it work really well what it does is it there's an and 
predicate and a not predicate. The and predicate tries to match the thing that the rule that is listed immediately after, in this case, back update. And, but then it unconditionally resets the position of the input stream back to where it started. And it, all it preserves is the knowledge of whether or not it succeeded. And the not, it does the same thing except it inverts the whether it matches or not. So what I'm doing here is, is saying I attempt to match a back update. And as long as I don't match a back update, and that doesn't consume anything, but as long as I can't match a back update at this position, then I'll advance one character by matching anything. And then I do that any number of times. And then eventually I can match a back update at that position. And then this whole, um, and then this whole, uh, then this, uh, this expression here will fail. Um, and therefore we won't, uh, and therefore this expression won't match. And therefore we will stop the star and in, in peg parsing, uh, the repetition operators, star and plus, are always extremely greedy. They will always match as many times as they possibly can. Um, and in order to stop them from doing that, um, you use a, a something like I've done here. Like if I had just said anything star followed by a back update, that would be what you'd find in a generational grammar where you could say, well, I just have a bunch of stuff and then there's a back update following that. Um, but in this case, if I put anything star, it would just consume the entire file instantly and not match anything useful. So I have to say anything but a back update by using a, a phrase like this. And then I match my back update. Okay. So back update is a little more complicated. We have, it matches a year number, a month number, a day number, um, and possibly a time. The question mark is zero or one uh, of those. And each one of those things that matches is bound to uh, a variable. YR, MO, day, and time, that if it matches, then the result of the match is, is tied to that variable. And the result of the match is whatever is returned from the semantic action for that, for that rule. So here, the semantic action for matching, once we match the whole thing, then we take year, MO, day, convert it to a date and time, and we add it to a collection called backups. Well, where'd this collection of backups come from. It's an instvar. This is um, a grammar class. We have an instance of the grammar that when we start, when we send it the, the start message to instantiate it, it gets sent initialized. And in the initialize method, we've set backups to be a new ordered collection. So, um, so we have those, we have those backups um, collection there in, to be able to use. Now notice that, that here I'm mixing pure small talk methods with, with Ometa methods in the same class. Ometa lets you do that because the, the grammars are distinct enough, um, largely because all the Ometa methods have this, have this equal sign here. You know, so that's in red because the highlighter, the syntax highlighter still thinks it's looking for small talk code and all Ometa code is, is completely foreign to it. So it makes it all red as being totally invalid, but it works. Um, so, so we create that, and then we, you know, year num, month num, et cetera. Year num is, is digits four, month num is digits two, day num is digits two, okay? So what we're doing here is we've got parameterized rules. We're passing in a four or a two to the digits rule. The digits rule is a rule that I made up, and this shows another feature of Ometa where you can um, do essentially, it's essentially inductive uh, programming. So here, if you pass in a zero, digits zero, if that matches, then your semantic action is the value zero. Otherwise, digits n is recursively defined as digits n minus one, um, which is bound to upper digits, followed by a single digit uh, d, um, and the semantic action for that is to take your upper digits, multiply them by 10, and add D. So you will actually be able to, when you say digits four, then you take the four digits and actually cr create a, a, an integer out of those in the parser. Now, digit itself is defined with a caret. 
an up arrow. This is a, basically a super send. This is referencing, this is referencing the digit rule in my super class. So I've subclassed this, uh, this grammar class from the Ometa2 class, and the Ometa2 class has a digit rule in it. And it recognizes digits just fine. Its semantic action isn't what I want, though. It actually returns the character. I want to return the value of that character. So I take the, I take the super class as digit rule, bind the result of that to D, which is the individual character, and then I ask and say a DU digit value. So now I've converted that to a number between zero and nine. So that kind of shows you how you can derive some of the ways you can derive grammars from other grammars in, in Ometa. Um, and so, you know, so pretty much now once we've done that, basically, you can see that pretty much the whole thing hangs together and will work, and I can actually demonstrate that. Um, this is the code for actually uh, doing it. We take a file stream um, on that file that I was showing you, and we say backup listing parser, match all, and we feed it as either a collection or a stream. In this case, it's a stream. And we tell it what the, the start symbol for the rule that we want to start is. And it returns, and we return that. And since, and what did I have for the semantic action of listing? Right, semantic action of listing doesn't actually do anything. We know we haven't bound any of these to any variables. We don't use any local variables there. What, we've, uh, what we do, though, is we return this instance variable backups, which now, want, because it's been added to every time we parsed a line, should have our collection in it. Let's go back here and inspect this. And we get this array of 106 state times. And, uh, and they look about right. So. Um, so I think it's working. Um. Now let's look at one or two other f kind of interesting things here about what's going on inside of Ometa. Now we see we've got some of these. Uh, let's take a fairly simple rule. This one will do. Let's view that in decompiled form. So this is what's actually in that method as far as the small talk uh, execution engine is concerned. This is what's in the compiled method. Um, there's a there's a funny true if true at the beginning, um, and that lets that's a um, uh, a hack that Alessandro put in to to m make it so that he only has to generate expressions. So he puts in a true if true because then he can just insert into that block um, an expression, and he doesn't have to worry about it being you know a method. So he he can just use more boilerplate. It makes it easier for him, and it's a um, it's a very, it's not a zero cost, but it's a very low cost addition to the actual runtime. And so you see we're, we're applying these different, um, uh, sending apply colon with the symbol, that's the name of the method, or the selector of the method, and then um, returning backups at the end. So that's the way it's actually working. It uses source-to-source -source translation when it's, uh, when it's compiling itself. Yes? I haven't looked deeply enough to understand all the details of it, but the, the explanation that, that he gave either on, uh, in the mailing list or um, I forget exactly where I saw it, but the question came up of why he did it, and he said, he said because, um, because then I, if I wrap it in a true of true, then, then it's an expression that I have to generate inside of it, not a statement. Um, well, of course, he does have many statements actually in there, but he's. Uh, and actually, that could be it, because, because it is, does automatically return the last thing, and that may, be, that may be what he's gaining from it. I'm not sure. Without parsing the statement. Right. Right. Uh, how is it different from Prolog and especially from the um, University of Leuven implementation of SAL and Smalltalk? I haven't seen that, so I don't know. 
because in prologue you also have the notch, which is actually what is called cut. You yeah. also have the end, and you also have uh, ordered rules. So right. uh, it yes. really looks like. Yeah, like like I said, it's not. This is not original to, to peg parsing. Um, it's been. I mean, those predicates have been used in other areas, and they've also been used in, in earlier parsers. You know, that's one of the ideas that um, that Brian Ford, you know, put together uh, into this into this sort of parsing package. But uh, any other questions right now? Okay. Um, also, the uh, peg parsers th uh, themselves are, uh, as presented in the paper, don't allow left recursion because they would go infinite. If your if your rule for um, for a production starts with that same production, then it would immediately dive down that left channel forever on uh, if it were pure recursive descent. Um, but all of the frameworks that I've actually talked about here, um, Ometa and, and Petit Parser in particular, um, can detect left recursion and prevent it. And they, they say, oh, we're, we're, we're going down the rat hole. We're just going to not, not go there. We're, we're going to the same rule at the same position, and that's never going to, going to get us anywhere, so we're going to go on to the next alternative, um, which makes writing your grammars much easier. And there's a couple of other examples that I don't think I'm going to have time to totally get into and which really aren't completely done anyway, but there's a couple of other things I just wanted to talk about because one of the things I've been looking at is, is sort of non-conventional uses for parsers, you know, where you're not actually dealing with a language. Um, you know, I certainly used to think of a parser as something that you did when you had an imperative language that you wanted to, or not necessarily imperative, but a language that you, you wanted to um, give the computer instructions somehow. And you know, and here it's it's data that we're parsing. Um, here um, we have this bad zip reader uh, with a bad zip grammar. I had some some zip files that had some that had a bunch of JPEGs in them that had somehow gotten truncated. And zip files are, and I don't know exactly how much they were truncated, but they were still pretty big, and they still had a lot of data in them. But zip files keep their master directory at the very end. So when you truncate them at all, unzip and utilities like that won't touch them. So I said, well, let's look at the zip file format. How hard is it? Well, let's write a parser. Let's write a parser to recover, recover the JPEGs out of these zip files. And it turns out that it was fairly easy because the JPEGs were already compressed, so the program that had actually created the zip files had decided not to compress them further. It just encapsulated them in the format. So you just have to um, read the, the, the file, um, file headers. It's because the format of a zip file is, is file header. Um, excuse me. Um, is the, the, you have a file entry header and then the data for that file and a file entry header and the data for that file over and over again and then, and then the central directory at the end. So you just have to parse the file header followed by the file data, and then you um, and then then you're good. And the file header is you know this local file header signature and all these little things. And these are all fixed length fields until you get down to this extra field, which is the number of bytes of extra file field length. And then the file comes after that. And um, oh no, the file name is also uh, variable length with the file name length and the compressed size and the uncompressed size of the file, which should be the same in this case. And so I wrote this up, and um, I won't go into all the details on this one, um, but, the, the, but basically it works. Now the problem is that it works because now this, my test file was 21 megabytes long and some of the other ones were, were longer than that. And it turns out that this is, you know, well, just because you have a screwdriver in your pocket doesn't mean that you should use it to pound in nails. Because what happens with this is that it blows memory out if you try to use it because it's, because it's parsing until it completes the, the execution of the, of the initial rule, until it completes that match. It may have to backtrack all the way to the beginning, it thinks, in the worst case. So it keeps 
it caches that internally. So it's caching that entire zip file in, in memory. And it's doing it in a fairly space intensive way. So it's slow and by the time it, it uh, pulled seven or eight files out, it was consuming about 250 uh, megabytes of, of image space. So, um, so I said, well, let's not do that. So I started modifying it to, to only do one file at a time and that's almost working. But I think that really better what we should do is simply instead of, um, uh, instead of, instead of starting with the rule zip file, which says one or more file entries, start with the rule uh, file header and let it parse the file header, get the information of the file header, position the stream to the beginning of where that data ought to be, read that data out outside of the parser, then feed the stream back to the parser again, let it parse the next file header, et cetera, et cetera. I think that would, would work pretty well, but I haven't quite gotten to that point yet. Probably another couple hours of work before I get that working. Um, but I do have, um, I do have the, uh, the directory that it created when it was blowing out memory and the, and, these, and the JPEGs that it succeeded in getting out. This was a test file. This one actually isn't truncated, but it was, it was not look cheating and looking at the file directory. And this is pictures from, from Brest last year. So anyway. Um, okay, so let's get back to the presentation um, slides. So that's uh, a brief look at Ometa. There's some other things that we didn't see, like matching. Um, we saw briefly, we saw the angle brackets, the pointy brackets, uh, which give you the, 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 the collection of characters that were matched at that up in that set of rules. Um, so for more information, the, you can go to the two, uh, the two tinlizzy.org uh, places where Alessandro has documented this. Uh, unfortunately, the documentation is not real good. Ometa is not, is changing. Um, we're in Ometa 2 now, which is completely different than, well, not completely different, but there are some significant changes between Ometa 2 and the original Ometa. Right now, the documentation that's out there is mostly for the original Ometa with a document that tells you what the changes are in Ometa 2. Also, much of the documentation is um, is for the JavaScript version because he did a JavaScript version and a Smalltalk version originally, and a number of people have done versions for other for other platforms, uh, other languages as well. And I have have a partially written uh, beginner's guide to Ometa Squeak, um, which I hope to put somewhere if people tell me where that's appropriate. Possibly the Squeak Wiki would be a good place for that, but I. I will entertain suggestions for where to put that. Um, but the code itself is in Squeak Source uh, under the Ometa project, so that's very easy. It loads into, into Squeak or, or Faro, and uh, I was running here in Faro. So, um, so let's move on to, to Petit Parser, Lucas's uh, project. Uh, dynamic grammars in Smalltalk. He's interested in the in the in the uh, dynamic nature of this, which we'll we'll look at a little more. Um, for information about that, um, there's a, a rather nice blog post um, that uh, Lucas put up when it was first introduced. Hopefully, that's still reasonably a good place to go. And the code itself is available um, in Lucas's uh, repository, which is that second uh, URL there. Now, Petit Parser is uh, a little different. Well, let's take a look at a, at a really simple um, example. And uh, thank you, thanks to Lucas for, for giving me this example to use. Um, this is uh, a rule for an identifier. Uh, it has to start with a letter, but then it can have digits mixed in. So if it were BNF, then you'd say letter followed by zero or more things that are either a letter or a digit. Now, as we've just seen in Ometa, that looks very similar. ID equals letter and then a parenthesized grouping um, of letter or digit followed by a star which has zero or more of the thing that's in that grouping. Now it looks a little different um, in, in Petit Parser because Petit Parser is actually written in Smalltalk syntax. It's actual executable Smalltalk code. So it's um, a little more verbose, but when you start looking at it, it look, begins to look very much the same. So here we are taking a, um, 
Um, we have uh, the symbol uh, letter, which is a, um, uh, a primitive parser. And we're combining these parsers together by sending them messages. So here we take, um, we take letter and uh, convert it to a parser, a primitive parser that, um, that recognizes a letter and another one that unrecognizes digits. And we send slash with the one parser as the argument to the other parser. And the result of that is a parser that understands one or the other in just the way that you would want it to do. And then you send that star and you get another parser. And, and uh, when you're done, you give this graph of parsers. You have a sequence parser that is created by the comma that says, I want to match the left thing followed by the right thing. And then um, the star parser knows to try to match the thing that it holds multiple times. The choice parser says, well, I'll try matching the left thing, and if that doesn't work, I'll, tr I'll match the right thing. And, and the advantage of doing this is, um, there's several advantages to doing it this way. One is that you can, that, you know, you can do it in Smalltalk code with methods, and there, uh, with message sends, and you can actually assemble these things by executing Smalltalk code, which is that sort of executable grammar idea that uh, Gil Abraca was doing in, in, uh, in Newspeak. But then you can also, uh, because it's this graph, of parsers, it's relatively easy to introspect on that, to do analysis on that graph. And you can also take uh, other graphs from other, um, of, of other uh, grammars, and you can then compose those uh, together by manipulating, by manipulating this graph at runtime. And um, I am not going to have any time to talk about that, and I don't know all the details of exactly what Lucas is doing with that, but hopefully Lucas will be telling us some of that stuff in his talk on Helvetia um, on Friday because that's what this was originally written for. Ah, a lovely sound of static. So, so I've taken my uh, parsers out of, out of the toolbox and I'm keeping them a little closer to hand now. Um, hopefully we've given you enough information to get you curious about uh, some of these newer tools. Uh, that you might at least try them out, uh, put them in your toolbox, and, and possibly even if you find them useful enough um, to put a parser in, in your pocket. Any questions? Um, I'm just wondering, uh, did you try to use spec parsers for Ruby, and does it make parsing Ruby easier? Um, well, that my like I said, my initial you know, my initial experiment with peg parser that I wrote um, was was with the idea of, of parsing Ruby, but then we ran into the problem that I talked about last year, which was that there was no published grammar for Ruby, and the um, you know and the the volume of of uh, of the code uh, that was in the .y file for the for the yak parser was you know like 186k of handwritten stuff, and so we, we cheated at first and, and used another parser. And then, and then um, you know, now we've got, there is a parser that's written in Ruby um, that we did not produce, but that we are using uh, with, with some modifications and some, uh, uh, some enhancements. Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay, we'll talk more later <laughs> if you want. Yes. <coughs> Will Ometa 2 work well with uh, socket streams? It should. It should. It's designed, it, it does not require the stream to be positionable. That's one of the things that led to my problem with the zip files um, was that it, it internally caches anything that it has read off the stream. So in order to do backtracking, um, in cases where it has to do backtracking, it caches the amount that it may have to backtrack by. What will happen if the network connection is uh, disconnected? If it's disconnected, it depends on what kind of error you get, I suppose. The, you know, what you would want to happen uh, depends on you know, how, you, how you do it. I mean, you would probably get a parse failure if you were in the middle of, of something because um, let's uh, go back here. One of the interesting things, um, in the Ometa2 class is this, um, is this end rule, which, which it automatically tries to match for end 
at the after the the thing that you that that you give it, and end is defined as not anything, which means I can't get another another object out of, out of my input stream. So so you would probably not be able to get anything at that point, and your and your parse would fail um, if the if the stream closed when you were in the middle of, of parsing. Does that does that answer your question? Okay. Um, you said that Omega is uh, implemented in itself, right? Yes. Um, so could you show us um, how the uh, how the Bootstrap works? Because yeah, I a find little it bit. Quite fascinating. The b the Bootstrap, well yeah. Basically, the the Bootstrap is pretty simple. Um, in order to package it into um, into Monticello packages, what was done was there's a uh, there's a, a preload and a postload. The preload is basically um, Ometa 2 written in Smalltalk. And then the load actually overwrites all those methods with ones that are actually written in Ometa, but since they're already there. And you saw that they're basically what you get when you decompile all those Ometa methods. But the, the trick is they're actually decompiled. Um, so the preload package is not handwritten, it's generated from the package info. Yeah, I, I, it's it is generated from the package info, right? Okay, I didn't, I hadn't realized that. I had looked at the package info very quickly, and then I said, ah, okay, uh, okay. It's a nice, cool trick that might it's come in handy for us. How fast are these things? How fast are these things? That's a good question. I haven't measured the speed. Um, however, um, I there's a the paper on uh, the petit parser does have some speed measurements in it, and I believe that petit parser is faster than Ometa. I don't know by how much. I think Lucas has measured that also. Um, but the what he found what they found was that the um, was that petit parser is Faster than a um, than an LR uh, bottom-up parser, but slower than a handwritten uh, top-down parser. So, so for the things that automatically parse, you know, it's it's pretty fast. And uh, there's, I believe that both Ometa and uh, Petit Parser do a partial memoization, selective memoization. Um, you know, pack rat parsers do complete can, can do complete memoization, which you consume a lot of memory and you get you get guaranteed linear time, um, no matter how much backtracking would normally go on. And so this is sort of a, a intermediate um, spot on that space time trade off. I uh, have a question with the, the pack parser that Mark, uh, Michael Lucas Smith wrote for Extremes. Yes. One of his uh, motivations, the way I understand it, was that he wasn't much in favor of this sort of having a method per rule because for reading more, more involved grammars, uh, he kind of likes to have a bunch of rules. You know, they, they are reasonably right. concise, and for understanding a more complex grammar, he prefer to see several ru rules at once with the definition. So he was sticking with the original grammar uh, syntax rather than coming up with different one or splitting it. So I was right. wondering what you think about that sort of. Yeah, it is It is inconvenient, I think, to have to, to go in and see each individual rule in isolation because mostly the rules are very short. Um, now, now um, Petit Parser actually has a, um, a tool a GUI tool that's a Petit Parser browser that I haven't had a chance to work with much, but I think that it addresses some of those some of those issues. Um, and you know, certainly you you can uh, you know a, to any, a tool could do that, but if you're using this uh, the s the standard browsers, then you can't. So I there's there are pluses and minuses. I agree with not not wanting to s being able to only see one rule at a time is a problem. Uh, 
um, I used a beta uh, Ometa once, and it uh, it wasn't so pleasant. Uh, I had to, I was forced to write unit tests uh, because the debugging wasn't so pleasant. Uh, how did it change in Ometa too? Um, apparently, as f as far as I understand, I have not used the JavaScript version. As I understand it, the JavaScript version, the debugging is easier. Um, I'm finding it to not be great. When, you're, when your parse fails, you, the information you're given is not everything that it, it would want to be, and that's something that I'm, I'm hoping to, to go in and investigate that in more detail and possibly um, uh, contribute some, some better solutions to that. Because yeah, that is not um, real great right now. When your parse succeeds, everything is great, and when it fails, you're kind of going, why, di why did this fail? So, so still, still a work in progress, but, but pretty neat. I think we may have time for maybe one more question, if anybody has one. Ah, Steph has a question, or maybe an answer. Yeah, but this is maybe more a question for to Bert, if he knows more. What is the interest of bootstrapping Ometa in itself? Because Maybe you don't need that. Or well, the point is you have to load it into the image uh, somehow. And if you own, um, so you need smarter code to begin with, right? But it is written in itself, literally. There is uh, very little smarter code. Uh, so it cannot uh, just do the stuff from, uh, from the original grammar. So what it happens is, if it's in the image already, you can use it because it's just generating smarter code. Uh, but if it's not in the image, you need to bootstrap it. And you do not want to separately maintain the smarter code. So what happens is that when you save, while you are saving the Monticello package, it decompiles the Ometa methods. And then when you load it, uh, then you save it again using the, um, the real source code. Yeah, my question was not at the implementation level. This was really conceptually, you can have something that parse something else. Why do you need the stuff to parse something else to be parsable by yourself? This is Th that's really that's really for me the conceptual question. This is maybe this is cool to be able to generate, decompile, recompile on the fly. No problem with that. Now conceptually, maybe uh, okay. You, you you just write your little bit of things that in small talk so that you can have the little bricks and then after you you, you can propose to have Ometa. I have the impression that it was more an exercise to show how the co stuff is cool, which is okay too. But I wanted to know if there is something else. Well, it's shorter and more succinct, and yeah, I think I think the point is that it's that when you're writing a grammar, Ometa is a much more natural language to write it in than Smalltalk. So, so if you want to change the grammar of Ometa itself, and Ometa is changing, then it's easier to to change it if you write it in Ometa. So, um, you know, so it, it you know it's kind of like. You know, and we we have a great advantage in in many of the Smalltalk implementations by having the Smalltalk parser written in Smalltalk, but you know rather than writing it in C and in writing the Ometa parser in Smalltalk would feel a little bit like writing the Smalltalk compiler in C. Yes, exactly. It makes it yes makes it much easier to to move to other languages. All right. So it's almost coffee, but we have a couple of quick announcements before we do that. So don't forget to vote for the books. For the book, by the way. <laughs> you have to work for one book. What is the best book? So you have until 12. So uh, I don't remember the web link. This was somebody has it somewhere I don't know if we put it on the website this is on the website okay and 
another um, announcement. So for people interested in Faro, in after lunch at one o'clock, we do a short meeting. So we had a couple of people that asked how they can contribute, and so we'll discuss that and take the opportunity to think when we can meet here in, in person. So after lunch at one o'clock in this room here. Thanks. And uh, after the break, for those who want to see James Foster, he'll be in the room upstairs uh, talking about scaling uh, Gemstone. And uh, Travis Griggs talking about Pango, uh, which is font-related stuff down in this room at 10.30, which is just less than half an hour.